東条戦争から2年誰が何を動かしたお前は平成を守っただけ白ひげは時代にけじめをつけただけ海軍本部は新戦力を整えた大物たちも仕掛けなかったまるで準備をするかのようにあの戦争は序章に過ぎない<音楽>お前がいつも言っていたな手に負えねえうねりとともに豪傑どもの新時代がやってくる歯車を壊したぞ<音声>もう誰も引き返せねえ Two of the oldest and strongest running themes throughout the 1000 chapter epic we call One Piece are stagnation and youthful rebellion. So, today we're going to talk about many of the ways these themes have intertwined and been used throughout the story, most notably within the post time skip era. So, let's get to it. The world government, along with the four emperors, have been in a 20 year stalemate over the war for the One Piece. Even decades after his execution, No pirate could surpass Gold D. Roger. Strong candidates certainly exist, so why has no one done it yet? Well, it's because no side was willing to fully engage the other for various reasons. To begin, Doflamingo says Whitebeard was ruling the seas while kneeling before the throne. Whitebeard had no interest in the One Piece and simply wanted to protect his family and territories. He was always the man closest to the One Piece, but he never wanted it for himself. Shanks seems similar in that he usually seeks to resolve conflicts without violence and acts as some kind of peacekeeper. Of course, his motives are still largely a mystery, but he's definitely not operating the same way the other emperors are. The world government has goals much larger than just the One Piece. If the Pirate King is the one who rules the seas, or as Luffy interprets it, he who has the most freedom, then the world government seeks to rule the land and seas alike, and don't only embody any form of freedom. The One Piece to them would probably be more of a means to an end. And as a government body, they have far more obligations outside of the war for the One Piece. But what excuse do Big Mom and Kaido have? While the two of them have motivations outside the One Piece, they are most probably the two of the five who are most focused on getting it. Their recent alliance was made for obtaining the One Piece, and they are the only ones known to have a road poneglyph. Why did they sit by for 20 years? The answer is pretty simple. They just wanted to prepare. Marineford was a huge event because it was the first time two of these great powers went all out against each other. Kaido kept making weapons in Wano and traded with Joker for smile fruits, while Big Mom was having children and using them in political alliances. They didn't feel they could beat their opponents, so they sat and prepared. Big Mom herself is even bitter over how she couldn't ally with Elbaf. And without the alliance, she never had the confidence to go to all out war with the other Yonko. This mindset of needing to prepare can be seen with former antagonists like Gekko Moria, who raised the zombie army to fight Kaido, and Crocodile, who won his own kingdom in Pluton to fight Whitebeard. In fact, you can trace that mindset all the way back to Don Krieg in East Blue. Don Krieg created the largest fleet in East Blue in order to prepare for the Grand Line, the mysterious sea beyond his own. On paper, Krieg had everything an up and coming pirate needed. A huge fleet, loyal and strong men, superhuman strength, powerful armor, and even more powerful weapons and technology. He repaired all the tools and resources he could get. If this guy couldn't make it in the Grand Line, who could? But none of it helped him against Hawkeye Mihawk. His whole fleet was wiped out just like that, they didn't amount to anything. Yet Mihawk was willing to let Zoro, a single man not much stronger than Krieg himself, walk away from their fight, just because he respected his will to fight. If Krieg stood his ground and fought Mihawk like Zoro did, then it's possible Mihawk would have treated Krieg like he did Luffy and Zoro. However, Krieg ran away at the first sign of danger and went back to the East Blue to try and prepare all over again. The message here is obvious you can't spend your whole life preparing. Action and the risk that comes with it is what is necessary. 
Even the mechanics of the story often reward characters who are willing to take action. Hockey is simple enough to explain. Experience challenging those who are stronger than you is the best way to improve your hockey as Rayleigh puts it. Characters can be actively rewarded for punching above their weight. Even before hockey, you can see this kind of spontaneous power up appear in Eni's lobby or Zoro's battles with Omen and Mr. One respectively. Remember back to Don Krieg and Zoro's encounters with Mihawk. Despite both of them being equally as helpless against Mihawk's raw power, Zoro's willingness to fight earned Mihawk's respect, and his experience from that fight spurred him on to become even stronger. The will to not back down was what made the difference. But one just can't slam against unbeatable odds and come out a winner each time. To take action is to accept the risks that maybe things won't go your way. Luffy has failed numerous times, but what's important is that he doesn't let the failures discourage him from making another attempt. Each time typically smarter than the last. Rubber bounces back as they say. This can be seen with other characters as well such as Crocodile, Moria, Kuzan, and the Supernova. The original four emperors never truly opened themselves up to the possibility of failure, and therefore can never create an opportunity to defeat one another. Is it any wonder why Big News Morgans would think the worst generation has a better chance of finding the One Piece than the last generation did? The last generation stood around for 20 years and got nothing done. The worst generation earned that name because they were born too late to be big players in the 20 years the Yonko rose to power, but born too talented not to make waves themselves. It was ultimately Blackbeard who was the most responsible for the death of Whitebeard and the Marine Ford War. It was Luffy and Law who destroyed the Black Morgan and pushed the Warlord system into question, resulting in its abolishment. It was Luffy and Beige who dealt the first major blow to Big Mom's territory in years. And it was a trio of Supernova that ultimately defeated Kaido and Big Mom. Kaido and Big Mom were so insistent on their own greatness that they not only underestimated the next generation, but took their glory for granted, despite the fact they didn't have the One Piece to show for it. Whitebeard and Shanks show far less vanity in this regard going above and beyond to protect and guide the next generation. The world is changing faster than it has in a long time, and it's not because of the big scary emperors. It's because of those snot-nosed upstarts causing trouble where their seniors tell them not to. Now it is true that many members of the worst generation made long-term plans and sat in place to prepare themselves. But I don't think that the point One Piece tries to make is that you shouldn't prepare at all. It's true that Luffy's choice to spend two years training with Rayleigh is not dissimilar to Krieg's plan to regroup in East Blue. However, I think there is a big difference between their approaches. Luffy saw the pinnacle of the world up close after having seen what he can do against it, whereas Don Krieg never bothered challenging his first obstacle until its back was turned and on its way out. Luffy had far more understanding than Krieg did. Krieg even mistook Mihawk's swordmanship as a Delphi power for Pete's sake. Krieg didn't even know how little he knew. Like a frog in the well, as I believe the proverb goes. As for Law, I see his decision to spend two years as a warlord as a trait he picked up from Dolphamingo and then improved upon. Dolphamingo understood the systems that were above him and conformed to take advantage of them. His simultaneous positions as a warlord and as Joker the Underworld Broker made him an important asset to multiple parties. And as a result, none could touch him without pissing off the big dogs. However, despite creating a solid position for himself, he never rose above it and was too attached to that position. But unlike his subordinate Caesar, who wholeheartedly represents a compliance with the status quo and just wants a comfortable position for himself, Doflamingo has ambitions. He wants to be Pirate King, but is scared to fight Kaido. He wants to destroy the government, but he fights for them as a warlord. And most importantly, he put himself into a position where he needed to stay a warlord to survive. Delflamingo can't be King of Dressrosa if he's not a warlord. His position as King of Dressrosa wasn't really all that important to his plans, but Delflamingo just couldn't bear the thought of not living in decadent luxury. And maybe his long-term plan was to support Kaido until he was ready to defeat the world government alongside him, but while he was bolstering Kaido's forces with smiles, he was also giving Sea Prism Stone to the government. He's making the powers above him stronger and harder to overcome. Yes, he had his privileges, but in the end, he became just another gear in their machines. Dolphamingo has a tangle of threads pulling him in several directions, and as a result, he's tied in place. Safe and secure for the time being, but only until the worst generation kicks the world back into motion. Law's approach to the warlord system is similar to Dofi's, but different in a very important way. Law reaped the benefits of the warlord position, but never grew attached to that position or put himself in a spot where he couldn't afford to get rid of the title. 
After two years, he quit in order to set bigger plans in motion. He never lost sight of what he wanted, and so, he cut the gears. He took the step Dolphaminga was too cowardly to take. He stepped beyond the point of no return, and was ready to face the trial ahead. Vijay is very similar in this regard, except he conformed to the emperors instead of the world government, joining Big Mom with plans to betray her. But not every young pirate is as daring as Lon, Luffy, and Vijay. Hawkins is the supernova who let the odds beat him. He's ready to give up long before a fight starts, and his compliance to the powers above him only make those forces of stagnation harder to defeat. And I think it's interesting to see his obsession with numbers contrast with the other supernova. Drake is willing to bet on Luffy because a long shot is better than none. Killer openly mocks Hawkins for his unwillingness to fight, and in the end, Hawkins can't even overcome a subordinate of one of his contemporaries, while Killer's captain moves up to bigger opponents. While I thought Law was a much more direct foil for Hawkins, it's easy to see why Killer was the one to ultimately defeat him. Killer was a very unlucky man to say the least. He was forced to eat the worst kind of dull food and got the worst outcome possible. But he didn't let that or his past defeats hold him back. Hawkins tries and fails to appeal to Law's cold rationality. Despite both being calculating schemers, Law puts that energy towards finding the most likely paths to victory, not the safest route away from failure. And we see Kaido take advantage of this can't beat him joint mentality within his own crew. The Beast Pirates are organized in a meritocracy. Members are often given opportunities to directly compete with one another for promotions. Pirate captains are an inherently ambitious bunch. Those wishing to become Pirate King will have to compete in a global thorn war. But if Kaido can convince them that he is unbeatable, they will settle for competing for second place underneath him. Apu is very similar, but it seems he was opting for a path of least resistance. He didn't seem terribly ambitious, just a guy looking for a comfortable spot, like Caesar Clown. Blackbeard is something of an outlier considering he spent decades preparing himself before he even starting a crew of his own, but I think it's more accurate to say Blackbeard has been built up as the strongest interpretation of the coward's way of fighting. Not only are his plans simply more effective than most, but he is fully committed to the act. Sentimentality is worthless and practicality is king, and he's not afraid to abandon his safe, comfortable positions such as his spot underneath Whitebeard or his title as a warlord. Because he knows exactly what his goal is, and he's not going to be pulled between priorities like Dolphamingo. Although there is one oddity in this theme, one that I kind of failed to acknowledge earlier on. Kaido does embody a need to prepare, but there's also a brazen element in him. He's quick to pick fights, not afraid of failure, and undoubtedly powerful. But how is a man like that just as stagnant as someone like Big Mom? How I just described him, he isn't so different from how one might describe Luffy, right? Well, there's a not so simple answer. Kaido doesn't want to be Pirate King. Not really. Not in any way that would reflect how Roger held the title. What he wants is a legendary death that will give him an unforgettable legacy. Just like Odin, Whitebeard, and Roger, men he clearly looks up to. One of the biggest ideas Kaido's character represents is copying without understanding. Odin, Roger, and Whitebeard all died for a cause, a cause they intended someone else to pick up. Roger informed the world of his treasure. His words grabbed people's hearts and drove them to the sea, and on the path to inherit his will. But only if his way of life, a life of freedom, appealed to them. Odin wanted to open the borders and left it in the hands of his vassals and the citizens. Whitebeard wanted to save his family and protect the foundation for the next generation, and so the next generation carries on. But outside of his own glorious death, what does Kaido want to achieve? His world of violence is just a means for his glorious death after all. If Kaido died, what would he leave behind for his followers? No objective, no ideas or directions or philosophy to live by. There's no reason to remember a man just because he was powerful. Rocks in his forgotten existence is proof of that. Kaido once believed he could change the world, maybe be your boy himself. But the only smiles he gives to others is through cursed smile fruits. He understands his son wants to be like Odin, but thinks he'd be content being shogun of a country of slaves. His meritocracy is good at incentivizing the pirates who work for him, but because power and competition is all he fosters, there's so little loyalty among his ranks. Even he is convinced that most of them would abandon him if he had a big enough loss. Kaido says death is what completes a person, but there's no glory if you don't accomplish your goals, or pave the way for others to accomplish it for you, or to achieve their own. 
It seems Kaido's spirit and determination to change the world around him was crushed by something long ago, and he's resigned himself to being a pretender, forever second to the next pirate king he hasn't met yet, or the joy boy he couldn't become and will eventually be defeated by. A man looking for an empty defeat without so much as realizing how empty it is, isn't worthy of the seat of pirate king. It's a creative way to play with the theme of inherited will, while also illustrating how a man not afraid of failure can remain stagnant. Thank you all so much for watching. This script was actually based on an old blog of mine. If you want to see the original version, it's there, but it's just the same thing, but less, like a lot lesser and from a few years back, so it's not even complete. But again, thank you all so much for watching. Like and sub if you want to see more, and I'll see you in the next one. I will always be here to talk about more One Piece. <laughs> Kid, I'm not exactly sure what to say. Uh, I, I like him a lot, but he just seems to be incredibly stubborn and his solution is to hit bigger and harder. Like, maybe his lesson was to grab more scrap metal and guard for fighting a, <laughs> an emperor of the sea. I buy it, sure.